Cindy and I were driving home from San Antonio the other day and uh, uh, had the opportunity to listen to a sermon that you preached. Uh, I think it was a Sunday after Easter uh, at an Episcopal church. Uh, it was it was live streamed or maybe it, it, anyway, it was it was yeah. uh, you preaching. Uh, the disciples are hunkered down uh in, you know behind locked doors for fear of yeah, john 20 and uh and you talked about all these things that they had, they've been following jesus and then you followed that up with somebody wasn't listening and i thought <laughs> maybe that's the underlying message of listeners dare um you know oh. and uh uh Anyway, I, I, I thought that was a was an interesting thing and, and maybe somewhat the premise of your new book. Uh, yeah, um, I, my book is attempting to look at preaching uh, as an act of listening. <clears throat> as you know, to be a preacher, you got to be a good listener mm -hmm. and preachers are busy listening. In fact, our biblical study of the biblical text could be seen as an attempt to try to put away our prejudices and judgments about the text and listen and listen with the expectation that God intends to make contact with us uh, through this text. But of course, preaching is also directed toward uh, the congregation and I'm just newly impressed with how uh, list of a sermon does not come naturally. And maybe listening to anything doesn't come naturally, <laughs> as your spouse will tell you <laughs> in an argument, uh, you're not listening. But um, to listen well to a sermon means to ask appropriate questions, to have appropriate expectations, to realize that preaching may be a different kind of oral communication than one is accustomed to. And also, thus the title, uh, it, it's also an act of daring in that in preaching, we actually claim that God Almighty chooses to speak through frail, finite human vessels like us. Mm -hmm. Well, and so, yeah, in, in relating that, you've got both, uh, and I've got both these books here next to me in anticipation, Preachers Dare and <laughs> Listeners Dare, both of them, and, and you know, they, they, they seem very interconnected, especially as, you know, I, I read through Listeners Dare uh, from the perspective of a preacher, but also tried to uh, put myself as well as a, as a sermon listener uh, and our congregations and stuff. How, how do these two books r relate to each other? I think Preachers Dare came first a couple of years ago, but, but what, what's the comparison between the two? Um, the uh, Preachers Dare is, is basically from my Beecher lectures at Yale uh, last year. And that was my attempt to reflect on uh, well, I got the title from Karl Barth when he lectured on preaching. He talked about preachers dare. And I found that a very evocative. What do preachers dare? Well, from a Bardian perspective, they, they dare to talk to people about matters that people would probably rather not talk about. But they, more to the point on it, they dare to talk about God. <clears throat> and so much of our discourse is about ourselves, about humans, human dilemmas, human agency. Well, preachers stand up and dare to say, let's talk about God. Let me do all I can to lure you into a conversation you may have spent much of your life avoiding. That takes some daring to do that. I, I know any pastor can tell you it, it takes some courage to say to a couple in your church, uh, understand you're having some marital problems. Want to talk with your pastor about it? I must say, in my pastoral experience, when I've dared to do that, 
I, I fully expect it possible somebody to slam the door in my face and say, this is private, this is personal. It's interesting that people kind of find it hard to say that you're, this is private, this is personal, because kind of that's your job. But uh, more often they say, thank you, or glad you ask, or uh, glad you're here. But then uh, the, my second book, The Listener's Dare, sort of uh, moved out of that world, <clears throat> that conversation into thinking like, well, you know, the listener deserves some credit too, that <clears throat> uh, we preach in order to be heard. And there's a sense in which it's not really a sermon if it's not received by anybody. It's not really, I've sometimes said, it's not a sermon till God shows up and makes our words God's word. Yeah, yeah. But I, this book is a tip, take that just a step farther to say, it's not a sermon until God shows up and makes our word his word. But also in, until uh, somebody says, wow, I, I think I was addressed this morning. Uh, I think I heard a word that I did not tell myself. It is not self-derived. I think I heard a word beyond what even you as preacher were trying to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In fact, every preacher can usually testify that <clears throat> in preaching, you're often stunned by people after a sermon to say, hey, that was a great sermon. Thank you. That was a great sermon about X, Y, Z. And you say, hey, I got the manuscript. I wasn't talking about X, Y, Z. I, I didn't intend to do that. Yeah. Well, sorry. <clears throat> that is kind of an everyday observation that the Holy Spirit utilizes our sermons, jumps in, rips our sermon out of our hands, and says more in the sermon than we know how to say. And so this Lister Stairs, kind of a book about that. Yeah, yeah. So, and and uh, I agree. Get those text messages after, you know on Sunday afternoon, and uh, hey, you know, really appreciated what you said about this. This is how I think. It. And then, and I think, well, I, that's that's really not what I thought I said, but but I'm I'm glad that yeah. I'm glad that you heard that. Um, so I so uh, let's let's talk about that then in in terms of listening. You know, I've I've heard people say. Um, you know, I'm 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 only responsible for the message. I can't be responsible for how people hear it. But it seems to me that a preacher should be invested in in, in interested in how people hear the message. So I think there should be some of that. But it also seems that that the listener has to be has to have some skin in the game when it comes to the listening as well. So I think I think listeners dare, while maybe geared towards listeners, is also geared towards preachers because it's important for it to be that that dialogue. It's if if you're not communicating it well and only relying, you know, I I, I think the message is important. But conveying it well is is important to, to, to opening them up to the hearing. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, um, <laughs> but yes. so 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 in 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 writing uh, listeners dare and working through that. How how can that make us better preachers? Being aware of 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 the listening aspect. I think uh, one thing I say in the book is that a lot of listeners are surprised at how desperate most of us preachers are to hear from the listeners. I have said sometimes to laity, a lot of you get the sermons you deserve, and laity often push back on that statement. But I ask them, when's the last time you've ever said to your preacher? Thanks. That was a word I was waiting to hear, e even though maybe I didn't know it was until you said it. Or to say, uh, you know, I think I really disagree with you on this point. However, I really appreciate you standing up and saying it 
and uh, to which the preacher says, great, I'd like to hear my work, and we have coffee Monday morning, and uh, or, or to say, thank you. I, I bet you spent a lot of time on that. It felt like you really prepared. Thank you. Thank you for doing that for us. Uh, so I, I say that preaching is one of those activities where the listener bears some response, mm -hmm. uh, some responsibility right. for helping us proclaim the word. There are congregations where when you preach, the congregation says, amen, or says, right on, or say, okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Well, that, that's also, but it's also in the congregations I've served more typical that I have, uh, I, I realize unconsciously oftentimes I pick out people in the congregation and as I'm preaching, I watch them. And uh, I had a retired librarian that uh, she would sit there looking at me and during a sermon, when she would lean forward like this, I would say, um, and, and let, let me just say a bit more about that. Or uh, as you see, this is really my point, you know. And so, so you get that kind of verbal, nonverbal feedback. Um, but also in the book, I talk about systematic, intentional ways we could get better feedback from our listeners. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I've got some suggestions for that, some things I've used in the past. And I think we could, I say that I don't know any way for a preacher to grow or to get better without help and without people saying, I couldn't follow your sermon today, or I wish you had stopped after you told that story. That was so good. And I was kind of annoyed that you went on when we needed some time to kind of process that or to say, as people very rarely say to preachers, well, I hated for you to stop because uh, I felt like you had a lot of good stuff out on the table there and, and I kind of wanted to hear more. Well, wow. Uh, yeah. All that is so valuable for us as preachers. So a couple of things that I, that I want to want to get to here. One is that is that dialogue because it does become it's 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 not a monologue so much. I mean, it's, preaching is one of those one of those odd. Uh, it's, it's hard to pigeonhole it exactly into is this a speech that happens in church? It's not really. It's it's not really a monologue, but it's it's more of a dialogue, but an an odd dialogue because you people will ask me all the time. Can you tell when people are falling asleep? <laughs> yeah, because a lot of times they think they're, you know, they're in the sea of people and they're somewhat anonymous. Yes, I, I, I know who the people who didn't get to address last night are, um, but, but those are some of those nonverbal cues and those cues that you can receive, whether it's somebody falling asleep or whether it's somebody looking there with a confused look on their face or, or my personal favorite, they, they grab the, the, the pew Bible or their, their Bible and they start flipping through, whether they're checking my yeah. work or yeah. spark their, uh, uh, you know, curiosity about something. And, and, and that's where I think sometimes it's interesting to see that Holy Spirit work, they may not hear anything else I say, but something yeah. in that sermon, uh, the Holy Spirit prompted them and maybe took them on a whole different direction than yeah. the rest of what I was going to say, because now they're immersed in this dialogue with scripture or what have you. But yeah, you know, I think it's, I think it's important to be able to pay attention to the congregation. And you make a good point in here about not memor or, or not reading your sermon um, and and being able to to communicate and not just yeah. I, I know you know a lot lot there's a lot to be gained from looking at your notes following the manuscript but there's something to be lost too and that you lose eye contact with congregation and I've noticed with us preachers when we when we look down and we're reading you're losing contact. You're losing some power with your listeners, but you're also losing, as you point out, uh, all of those nonverbal, very important clues mm -hmm. about um, what's 
what's going on with the listener. And, you know, in daily conversation, well, the conversation we're having now, you know, your, your bodily presence is busy giving me signals. If we were in the room together, uh, I would receive even more information mm -hmm. and you, you'd, you'd be receiving more information from me. Uh, one of the things we've learned, I think, during the isolation of the pandemic is the limits of video preaching right, right. <laughs> and media technology. Um, so uh, I do want listeners to know how much they mean to us. And I heard a wonderful sermon Sunday that at the end of it, you we could decide whether the congregation credit for that wonderful sermon or the preacher because it was clear the preacher just was joyfully engaging the congregation and members of the congregation would stand up in the middle of the sermon and applaud and uh, go right on and everything you know uh, it, it was it was it was just wonderful and um, it, it it's also by the way why I say the normative way to preach is a pastor who is that in that congregation, caring for that congregation, that person preaching. Uh, I think that's important because what an amazing opportunity for deep communication when the one who preaches is one who is known and is preaching to those who are known. Um, this power there. And by the way, I, I never do that kind of preaching anymore. I'm always a guest somewhere. Uh, so I know the power that's that's there. And, and part of that power is that the listeners are much more accessible to the speaker. And the speaker also, I, I had some of the churches I've served have told me things like, it took us about a year before we knew how to listen to you. <laughs> we, we didn't we, we had never heard irony in a sermon. <laughs> We'd never heard humor. Uh, the way you don't have endings of your sermons. We, we just hadn't heard that. So we had to kind of learn. Uh, one woman told me, she said, I had to learn with your preaching. I better get on board in the first few minutes or I just missed the train. <laughs> and I said, uh, okay. <laughs> so... Uh, but, but maybe we preachers could do more. And I got some suggestions in the book for like creating a better class of listeners and, and kind of saying to listeners, it might be fun every year or so to preach a sermon on how to listen to a sermon. And, and I'd love you to use my book to do that. Mm -hmm. But to say, here's what I'm trying to do in the sermon. And a lot of that can be so helpful uh, for instance, when listeners say, you know, your sermon didn't give me anything to apply to my life, my daily life. Right. And the implication is, as we all know, that's the purpose of a sermon. And sometimes it can be helpful to say, you know, I work from scripture. I work from a biblical text. And I'd like to say to you and do to you what I think that text says and does. Uh, so uh, if I get a text that has some suggestions for things that you should apply to your daily life, I promise you, I will do that. However, isn't it interesting how very little of scripture does that? <laughs> does that say anything? And, and I'm, in fact, I critique a lot of preaching that goes on today by saying, I, when the gospel is reduced to kind of common sense, rules for better behavior mm -hmm. um we we're not being biblical right right <laughs> i've 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 seen that heard that <laughs> um i think uh in in the i think you've had that influence on me in my preaching oh my um and uh uh, yeah, I, and, and sometimes I think it makes people feel a little bit uncomfortable. And when they're uncomfortable, they're listening. Uh, you know, it, it, you, yeah, um, I, I take Jesus as my model or, or Paul or the, the way that there's, 
often in the reports of early Christian sermons, there is a kind of an aggressiveness there. There's a kind of, hey, I'm intruding into your space with a word mm -hmm. that you may be glad to receive and it may be life-changing. You may be furious to receive. I love that in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, where uh, you get these kind of redundant, repetitive sermons, uh, kind of the only place in the New Testament you get kind of sermons. And um, Paul preaches a sermon one place and everybody says, wow, that thousands of us want to be baptized. He preaches virtually the same sermon in another place and they say let's kill him and throw him in jail or whatever and um, I kind of love the fact that these early Christian preachers don't they obviously want to make contact with the hearers they obviously want to affect the lives of the hearers at the same time the hearers acceptance or rejection doesn't seem to be the point of their speaking the point of their speaking seems to be God. Uh, what does God want to say? Mm. Not what would you like to hear? So, yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll look at other church websites and 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 things like that, and and I've always said, you see, uh, on you know X Y Z church, uh, you know, whatever it'll say oh come come here pastor so and so who preaches an uplifting message every week and i thought well i, yeah. I kind of want mine to say uh <laughs> come listen to wade a, a few times a year he teaches he preaches an uplifting sermon every every six to eight weeks preaches an uplifting sermon the rest of the time you're going to be fairly uncomfortable <laughs> uh, yeah the, yeah well, well yeah i'd say if every sermon is uplifting it you know, I'm, I'm sorry, we kind of think the Bible is more important than you are, and, yeah, yeah. and we like our preachers to try to preach from the Bible. I guarantee Wade is more uplifting, say, than preacher Paul is, <laughs> you know, and, and I guarantee Wade is never as negative and critical and difficult as Paul is, uh, so you, you can, they can count on that, and I think Maybe we preachers ought to aim to be, well, we aim to be as biblical as we can, but also aim to uh, 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 let people hear as they hear, maybe let them not hear as they are unable to hear. Uh, one, one of the claims of scripture repeatedly is you can't hear God without help it's called the holy spirit that it it takes at least two to listen to a sermon it takes me uh, to, to to listen but it also takes the holy spirit to uh bore those words into my soul and uh i also say in the book uh, one of the skills of listening to a sermon is if you're a Christian, you got to be used to hearing, to listening to a bunch of sermons that say nothing to you and have absolutely no relevance to you at all, but may have relevance to the person next to you in the pew. Maybe you didn't receive a bad cancer diagnosis this week. Well, good for you. The person next to you in the pew did, okay? And uh, uh, you you got to sometimes sitting through a sermon is a way of loving your neighbor and saying at the end of the sermon I hope that sermon meant more to you than it did to me <laughs> uh, bless you uh, and and then also if it's true that the, a sermon to hear a sermon requires the instigation of the Holy Spirit we do not control the Holy Spirit. It is a gift, grace. And that means God is free to speak or not to speak. And if somebody, someone said to me after church Sunday, I didn't preach, but a gifted preacher did. Uh, after church Sunday said, uh, that uh, 
is the first time I have felt close to God uh, in this church in a year. Uh, and it was wonderful. Mm. As I thought about that comment, I thought, was that a good average <laughs> or not? I mean, I was thinking like a lot of people say, if if you have one kind of life-changing, vivid encounter with God every 10 years, good for you. That's probably above average. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and so. Well, okay. So I, I want to, I want to plug another book real quick, just because something you said, or, or what we were talking about earlier about listening to the congregation in the midst of, of the congregation, I was reminded of uh, one of our friends, former student, uh, former classmate of mine, Ryan Tonetti, wrote a book called Preaching by Heart. I think you wrote uh, yes. you know, uh, uh, something on it. And um, I think it's a great, a great book and great premise for preparing sermons. And, you know, the whole idea is to uh, be able to preach without notes so that you can be more attentive to the congregation. Mm -hmm. So I just, I want to throw that out there. So anybody watching this. Thank you. Can, Ryan, can yeah, I think Ryan really did a beautiful job of recovering preaching as testimony. Like if you ask me, uh, hey, how is it with your soul? Tell me about an experience you've had with the risen Christ recently. If I pull out a piece of paper and read from it, ha, that doesn't get it. <laughs> Uh, and I think preaching as testimony, uh, I must say, I, I think I'm often tied to my notes it, that it, not because I'm having difficulty remembering uh, the, the sermon, but more so as a sense of security or maybe out of my delusions of control that, <laughs> hey, if I got this down on the paper, and if I can, there it is, I can read it, there it is, there it is, I've captured it. I know that I'm going to control communication here. Uh, I know that I'm going to say exactly what I want said and that will be heard as I want it heard. No, uh, I guarantee write it down, preach it boringly, word for word, the Holy Spirit still maintains the prerogative to get in there and rip that thing out of my hand and say what the Holy Spirit won't said. And therefore, I'd say to preachers, if you basically have a personality where you have control issues, and I think maybe I do, uh, it, it can be disruptive. It can be difficult as people come out and God has chosen to speak a word to them that you had no intention of saying. And if you wanted to say it, you would certainly not say it to them. But hey, welcome to, as I said, listening isn't a solo activity. Well, preaching isn't either. We, we preach under the instigation of the Holy Spirit. Right. Well, so, so you know, you've said before, and, and, and I agree, God speaks through preaching. You know, that's, that's, uh, mm -hmm. God speaks. How, how often does Will Williman get to listen to preaching? Um, because I'm, I'm sure you're, you're, you're guest preaching all over the place. And, and uh, even when you are uh, yeah. in a congregation, I'm sure it's tough to uh, go incognito oh. as Will Williman to a, to a church somewhere. And really, but, it, it, it can be, yeah. I think uh, this gives me an opportunity to celebrate the fact that, you know, when I was a young preacher, I was desperate to hear another preacher and never had any opportunity to do so. Uh, tuning in at the Protestant hour at 7 a.m. on Sunday mornings, I could hear Edmund Steinley or someone. But, uh, well, now with YouTube, uh, their mornings, I listen to four sermons <laughs> as I'm on my elliptical. Mm -hmm. Rarely is that a life-changing, engaging experience, I think, oftentimes, because it's on YouTube, and I'm not in a congregation, I'm not focused. Uh, but 
I think one of the burdens that we preachers, I don't know if you experienced this, but I, I think one of the burdens that we bear is that when you're trying to be a preacher, you're learning how to preach, you got to become a critical listener. You, you've got to become that, that artist who steps back from some other's work of art and says, huh, how did that work? Or I wonder why this is not working. Aha, uh -huh. you analyze. And I think that's just an occupational hazard. Uh, I had the joy this past Sunday of listening to a preacher. He was an African-American preacher and all. And uh, I was in the congregation and uh, I, I wanted it to be a good experience. Uh, I had, had my family with me and all all and and I needed it to be a good experience uh, with a week I'd had and um, I heard uh, it it was just amazing and and I realized you know partly maybe the Holy Spirit helped me lay aside my critical thinking uh, I, I just sat there and let him minister to me rather than my trying to say how can I learn something from this sermon from my own preaching maybe but the good news is there's a lot of good preaching out there and and on YouTube I've gotten to visit Pentecostal churches visit regularly with a church in Switzerland it's a young congregation the preacher preaching sermon and all and it um, I find it faith engendering. I find it uh, just encouraging uh, my fellow workers. And, and to me, I get a lot of rewards for my preaching. I mean, I get to go somewhere and be a kind of celebrity and they pay to have me in the congregation with them. And so they built up, they're really trying to say, look, we've invited this preacher in here and all. What I admire and I hear it a lot is, is some preacher in a little crossroads little Methodist church somewhere who stands up and just preaches a quite wonderful biblical testimony uh, to about 20 people and me online. And I think that's a great credit to the craft of preaching. Wonderful. I, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And I, and I do. I, I appreciate you so much. Uh, and and the shape, uh, I think, you've given my own preaching, and I see it in, in so many others. Um, uh, and I, I, I enjoy that listening as well. I try to hit the treadmill with some with some sermons from time to time or driving, I probably ought to do it more on the treadmill. Um, but, uh, but I, I do appreciate it and I appreciate, uh, you know, the 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 information that that you put out uh and i think uh listeners dares a, a great book i'll, I'll uh, tell you i had actually uh pre-ordered uh listeners day <laughs> listeners day oh, or it thank you came out and then uh and then i got my uh well you can this this is how so i i got this from you and, and you can see all the, the, the yes it made I, Maybe it's illegal to print it out. I don't know. Well, I hope the book bears that much scrutiny. Also, uh, it's it's a short book, and uh, it's organized. Begins with questions uh, on each chapter, mm -hmm. and I'm hoping it might be helpfully used in congregations where preachers did some training <laughs> in listening That's and some sharing. Yeah, that's well. That's exactly that's one of the reasons I pre-ordered it um, before I even, yeah. you know, had a chance to look inside. I, but I, thought, I had a film company talk me into doing a uh, documentary on how I move from a text to a sermon, mm -hmm. and it uh, aired on PBS. And it, uh, well, I said. You know, most of the my move from a text to a sermon ain't that interesting visually. <laughs> here's me sitting in my study reading a commentary. Here's me writing it down. Here's me, you know. And uh, they they said, no, we we really think a lot of Christians are really curious about how where does this come from? Mm -hmm. How did this happen? 
So you take me through the uh, text to uh, preaching in a little Episcopal church in North Carolina and, and after the sermon and talking to people and all. And uh, it turns out thousands of people are actually curious about that. So I say to preachers, uh, hey, uh, I hope this will be a good tool in your ministry to help people get more out of sermons mm -hmm. as Christ means of getting more out of us. Mm -hmm. So, well, well I, thank you, Wade. I, I appreciate it. I've only got a couple minutes uh, left here before I've got to go, but yeah. Uh, once again, in, enjoyed the visit. Uh, hopefully, uh, get to yeah. visit again before too terribly long. Hope you're doing well. Doing doing great. Uh, loving life down here on on the Texas coast. Um, like I say, here we we get all the heat and humidity, but not much of the ocean breeze. So ah, uh, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, but but you're uh, you're welcome down here anytime to enjoy the uh, the tropics uh, of Texas. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, from the tropics. Yeah, uh, well, yeah. we uh, we're graduating a, a, another class uh, this this weekend. So uh, wonderful. I certainly am grateful for our uh, camaraderie. Well, well, thank you, Wade. We keep talking you. about trying to get together a, a class reunion and uh, maybe maybe doing it yeah. in Durham. But It'd be fun. Anyway, if we do, I'll let you know, and and uh, you'll have to come. Okay. Out. All right. Okay. I appreciate Thanks, it. God bless All you. All right. Man. Bye. Bye-bye.